look at this. Okay, so here's a trail, and the trail goes pop, 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 pop over here, and then it takes a right angle turn. There are rocks in the Death Valley Desert that move across the ground on their own, leaving behind bizarrely long tracks. And for a century, nobody could figure out why. So look at the size of that puppy. And it turns out no sweat to move every single rock out here. We're talking many, many bulldozers strength worth of force. So what force has been making rocks move for over a hundred years when humans aren't looking? The first recorded account of the trails was in 1915, when a prospector named Joseph Crook, who was supposed to be out searching for precious metals, found the rock trails. Crook reportedly showed the rocks to his wife, who couldn't believe that the larger rocks would move naturally. So she skeptically marked the position of a big rock, and of course, it eventually moved away from the mark. The lake bed came to be known as the racetrack playa, and the stones, the sailing stones. You go to the desert and you see the tracks these giant rocks have left behind, some that are parallel where, where the rocks have moved at the same time, and then they've turned the same time, and you're like, what is going on? So I started looking into it, and what I found was a heartwarming story about two cousins who solved the mystery together, and a clever experiment that had convinced scientists that the correct solution was wrong. And then this moment where scientists all over the world were reaching out saying, oh, I have this other mystery with rocks moving. And a young scientist whose life was changed by this mystery. So back in 2014, cousins Dr. Richard Norris and James Norris solved the rock mystery at the racetrack playa. And now they're back. So I spent 16 hours traveling out to meet them and join in on their latest adventure. Check your spare tire, <laughs> sharp rocks ahead. No AAA. Ah! vibrating my butt. Hey, Di hey, Diana. Hey, I'm Diana. You're watching Physics Girl. I think it's also worth taking a minute to appreciate how incredible the setting is for these rocks. Death Valley is in the northern Mojave Desert, sitting in the rain shadow of the Sierras. Death Valley is one of the driest places on the planet, and it is certifiably the hottest. So naturally, we went there in the winter. <laughs> When we went, we camped out for a night in Stovepipe Wells, which is a nice midway point because it has a gas station and a general store that once served 12 pots of coffee in an hour. And then we took a four-wheel drive Jeep and then trekked the 24 miles down a bumpy dirt road. And you sit there clenching and hoping you don't pop a tire. All up until you see the playa. I couldn't even wait for Levi to come film me because <laughs> I raced out onto the racetrack by myself. Everything is so uniform. And then, boom, a track. That's <laughs> so cool. This is the lowest point over here. Okay. And, uh, and if you go up to the grandstand, which is the pile of rocks at the far end. Okay, so that's, that's what the grandstand is. It's called is. the grandstand. The lake bed of the racetrack is filled with dried sediment that extends 1,000 feet down into the ground. So one of my first thoughts was whether the tracks were caused by an animal but then you see this place. We're like, what lives in Death Valley? It's called Death Valley. There can't be much. Well, we had a, a beautiful uh, kangaroo rat in our camp last oh, night. Oh, cute. And they're the cutest little thing. They're cute, but they're not pushing around rocks that weigh as much as refrigerators. Richard had heard about the racetrack problem many years prior in school. And eventually the itch of the mystery got to him enough. Well, so what happened fundamentally is that Jim said, hey, I think we could probably solve this little problem. Yeah. So they began coming out to the racetrack and trying out experiments. Jim had the idea of putting the GPSs on the rocks. Mm -hmm. We set out our own rocks, of course, drilled holes in the rocks to put a GPS tracker in. The switch would be thrown and the GPS would turn on to live mode, okay, sure. collecting data constantly. Well, you would know the rocks had moved, but how would you know what had happened? And then con connecting that with a weather station meant that we would know what the weather conditions were. So the duo set out their trackers in the winter of 2011. <laughs> and their collaborator, Ralph Lorenz, reportedly claimed this would be the most boring experiment ever, as they prepared to wait for something to happen, knowing that it might take decades. But a mere two years later, the motion-activated GPS trackers switched on on a day when they least expected movement. Before we find out why the GPS trackers switched on, a quick message. 
I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Sometimes I get caught up worrying about conflict with other people for months or years, and I wish I just talked it out and frankly just stopped ruminating. BetterHelp assesses your needs and matches you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating within 48 hours. It's not a crisis line, it's not self-help, it's professional therapy, but done securely online. There's a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's 20,000 plus therapist network, which may not be locally available. And the service is available worldwide, so you can log in anytime and send a message to your therapist. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches too, so they make it easy and free to change therapists if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today, so visit betterhelp.com slash physicsgirl that's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash physics girl, and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. And as a special offer to viewers of Physics Girl, you can get 10% off the first month at betterhelp.com slash physics girl. And now back to the day the GPS trackers turned on when the cousins hadn't expected it. Because after reviewing prior experiments, here's what they had expected to see. There was these two camps, you know, it's strong, powerful winds, it's ice. Yeah. And we were both inclined towards the wind idea. Okay. The sharp and carry experiment sure suggested that ice wasn't the driver. Yeah. That was I have to confess, convincing to me. The reason Richard is confessing is because the experiment he was referencing was so beautifully convincing that it was not ice. Here's how that experiment went. Scientists put stakes in the ground surrounding a couple rocks, and then one day, one rock moved out and the other one stayed in. The researchers were convinced if sheets of ice were dragging the rocks, then both of the rocks would have moved. So at this point, James and, and Richard pretty much rule out ice. They're team wind. So they head out to the playa expecting a hurricane to blow the rocks around. And our expectation was that we would come out here with a four season tent. We would stake it down. When it was howling outside, we'd oh peek out, you know, and we'd see the rocks scooting by kind of thing. But on a chilly morning with a light breeze, a few days after a snowstorm had brought enough water to make a three inch pond on the playa, something happened. I have an embarrassing thing to say. You know, we saw it like an hour after it happened. Okay. But we were unfortunately over there, about oh, a kilometer no. away. Oh, no. And we saw all the ice that had been a part of this big ice panel piling up out there yeah, yeah, yeah. from the other side. Yep. And it was like, hmm, Jim, what's going on? <sighs> and then we walked along the shoreline over there and there was big piles of this clinker ice. It kind of goes clink, 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 clink yeah, all over yeah. the shoreline. That's, you know, plate glass, thin, you know, clear, beautiful glass yeah. with rocks in it. Giant sheets of ice, hundreds of feet across, were starting to move across the playa. And then we arrived down here. We climbed up on the, what we call the source hill, because that's where almost all the rocks come from. Gotcha. And it was like, oh my God, we missed it. It's you know, been, the biggest. Happening. The yeah. biggest move event in 10 years, and we were on the wrong, you know, kilometer away. Cool. Well, and then it was like the scales fall from your eyes that literally that, you know, then we understood immediately what was going, what was going on. on. What they realized was that on rare occasions, when the playa fills with water from rain or snow and is deep enough to form floating ice during exceptionally cold nights, the pond freezes to form thin sheets of ice. The ice then begins to melt in the daytime sun. The ice breaks up, and as the wind picks up, it blows the sheets of ice across the playa and drags the rocks with it. And of course, the rocks drag trails in the ground as they go. The winds are not strong. I had to kind of hold my hat off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that wind stress over a couple square kilometer area of, of floating ice of course, it causes the ice to move. Here's why this is all so amazing. We do know how thick the ice was, and the ice was about an eighth of an inch thick. Wow. Isn't that great? What Richard and James soon realized was that the corral experiment hadn't disproved the ice theory. It had disproved thick ice. Like, yeah, move a rock like that with ice that is, you know, thin enough to tear past those stakes. No, that doesn't seem reasonable. The ice was thinner than anyone thought was possible. <laughs> yeah. This is a little That's thin so cool. sheet of ice. That's amazing. That's Both start moving yeah. and then they move for 16 minutes with the same wow. exact pattern, but they're 
650 feet apart. Yeah. And you're going, that's a single panel of ice. Say, yeah. So the wind moves the ice and drags the rocks and the rocks make the tracks. But here's the thing. The pond isn't big enough to fill the entire playa, and yet... Some of the rocks do travel all the way over to the distant shoreline. Yeah. How do we know? And you know that they've far traveled because they're this distinctive dolomite. Okay. And the only source which of is, dolomite is from there. Which is just right there. How do they get there? When you get a pond, the pond forms here. It's almost a flat surface. The pond goes there. <laughs> it's a classic, so what the oceanographers call a seash event. Seash event. A seash is when strong winds can cause really rapid changes in the height of water. In this case, it moves the entire pond from one end of the playa to the other. The pond essentially rolls uphill. And all the rocks just go, off they go. Um, you know? And then at the end of the day, the wind dies down and it moves all the way back. So they published a paper describing what was going on in 2014. And what happened next was amazing. My favorite part of this whole story is that after you publish your paper, there are all these scientists from all over the world that are sending you emails and mailing you photos. They're like, wait, wait, I have something. We were out here at one point and we met this couple in the parking lot. And the wife told us this story about seeing this video uh, on TV of, of ice bursting through somebody's garage in the Great Lakes. And you can find these on YouTube, these pictures of, of ice that is being blown across the Great Lakes. Of course, an enormous area, big, long fetch, right? And it forms mountains that are like, I don't know, at least a couple meters high. Everywhere he went, people started telling him about mysterious things that they had found of rocks and ice being moved by unusual forces. And then we've observed in, in Google Earth images of Great Slave Lake, uh, basically house-sized rocks that apparently have scribed trails in the bottom of the lake. But there are also still some other unanswered mysteries. And then there's this place in Spain uh, that is out uh, in the La Mancha area, man of La Mancha, you know, and they have had documented rock trails on them. Those folks say that it is not this mechanism. And their argument is that they're salt lakes, and so the, the salt, it lowers the freezing temperature of water enough that you wouldn't get ice forming on the surface to make the rocks move. I don't believe that story. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be, you know, a future adventure to Spain. So I think I finally understand why it took so long to solve this mystery. We could tell that the rocks move for about 15 minutes and then they and stop. And they're done. You, you have to be here right at the right time. At the exact, you know, it, it is, is a it perfect is, Goldilocks. It's Goldilocks on cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, the whole different children's story that uh, we don't usually tell. <laughs> it's the hottest place on earth, but you need it to be freezing at night. Or it doesn't rain that often, I would imagine. That's the key. It's incredibly windy, but you need just gentle winds. And you need a source of rocks on this playa that's mostly a thousand feet deep of just straight sediment. Everything about this problem is just perfect, which is one of the things I love about this story. But the thing I love the most is this next bit about a little girl from Germany. So one of the people who contacted us after our paper was published was a 13-year-old girl okay. in southern Germany. Her name is Ronja Spanke, and she had been doing experiments to simulate what was going on here at Death Valley for her science fair project. <laughs> and it turns out, like, no sweat, okay, to move every single rock out wow. here. We're talking many, many bulldozers' strength worth of force. The whole notion that it had to be like really super slick, you know, to get the rocks to move, this is bull okay? And Ronya showed that in her little, you know, after school experiment. And it turns out that she won a whole series of science fair projects. I, there's not that many scientific things we go see that there's a lot of people out here coming to visit and check out. So yeah. this one is pretty spectacular. And you can go see the stones if you want. It's not easy. I know Richard and James were really eager to solve the mystery, but I don't think they ever expected the impact they were going to have on other people's lives. And I can't wait for the answers they uncover next. Thanks so much for watching and happy physicsing. Thank you.